All right, today we're going to talk about um, a common, uh, inc increasingly common water quality challenge that has lots of management implications. So we're seeing these play out now right here on our coast or playing out in coasts around the world. So this is um, a bit of our uh, introduction to sort of um, oceanography and those kind of things. And, and uh, we're just going to start looking at um, how uh, one other set of data that we can explore um, issues going on, in this case, with near sh primarily with nearshore water quality um, in the ocean. So again, remember, we're, we're, the overall question here is, uh, has things, have things become too complex to manage? Today we'll talk about that in terms of uh, blooms. So by way of, this should be background. You guys should have seen all this before. But just in case, this is, this is new. I want to make touch base, make sure we're all on the same page. The first thing is the right terminology to apply to these things. So we're talking about uh, algae. Algae refers to um, protists, a paraphyletic group that of, of these critters of these organisms that um, capture, primarily, are capturing light and are, are photonivores, are eating light. Um, algae um, refers to multiple things. That could be multiple individuals. It could be multiple species. An alga is an individual, right? So, so, an indivi so one cell, let's say, of this phytoplankton would be an alga. When we talk about some of the um, macroscopic protists, some of the ma macroscopic alga or macroalga, sometimes things that, for example, giant kelp, things of that nature that, that might resemble externally um, a plant, sometimes people colloquially use the term plant for this individual. It's technically not a plant, but sort of a shorthand people sometimes use. Um, and then anything relating to algae, we'd use the term algal. So this algal bloom this algal toxin, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, just for completeness, we're talking about various primary producers. So, so things other than algae could be included in, in um, problematic levels of primary producers in our, in our coastal zone. Things potentially that that might include would be things like mangroves, things like seagrasses, things like so-called submerged aquatic vegetation. Although today we're really going to focus, and typically we focus on other things, but, but there are non-algal primary producers, obviously, in our coastal zone. Uh, just wanted to flag this because this is, this is one of my banes of my existence. So I did my PhD on algae because I love algae, right? And because uh, all my friends worked on fish, and I was like, oh, fish are so boring. I don't work on everything but fish. So... Um, so I, I worked on one component of my PhD was on, was on algae. Um, it's important to say that we, we use this term as in sort of a management context, but it's really a, 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 real, a group with a lot of variation in terms of uh, biochemistry, in terms of evolutionary lineage, et cetera. And this, is, this particular uh, phylogenetic tree, this series of relationships, um, was published in 2012. And it seems like every year or two, we're, we're sort of tweaking this around. Now, as an aside, this is a huge problem for you and I as managers. So one of the organisms that I worked on for my PhD that I finished in the, in the late 90s, 2000, has changed names three times. It might be changing its name a fourth time, right? We learn these Latin names, these binomial nomenclature names, because the notion is, hey, this is persistent, right? We might have our common name, that these people in this area refer to it, or those people over there refer to it, but this is the stable name. When that name is changing all the time, that's a challenge for folks like you and I that are trying to do conservation, that are trying to do inventorying, are trying to do tracking. Is this population going up, going down? And it's a non-trivial thing. And, and why this happens is because of the incredible power of our molecular techniques. So most of these folks aren't doing rigorous uh, some are, but, but many folks aren't doing structural analysis, tissue, this and that. They're cell smashers, right? Not to use a bad word, but cell smashers, well, they are. Uh, and they're do, they, they, they run, they grab some individuals, uh, run them through some gels, do some phylogenetic relationships, and they go, ah, new species, blah, 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 blah. 
that is problematic from a management standpoint for the for these term this terminology these names this nomenclature to be changing so frequently so one of the things that's happening is we, we tend to fall back on our old terms that we've used historically because that's what people old people like me know and and so it's, it's not an ideal situation this is getting sussed out but it's it's a bit of a challenge but this is our situation right now so this is one of our most recent um, uh, so-called trees of life the red algae are over there on the right. The greens are kind of up there in the middle. The browns are down. This is for macroscopic guys. The browns are down there um, in the bottom. And then we have some of our unicellular, our microalgal individuals scattered throughout. It's, it's, not as it, it's not like fungi. It's not like mammals where these guys share pretty similar constraints. It's much more like, hey, this guy is not a that and not a that and not a that. So he must be one of these type of deal, OK? Having said that, uh, so that's just for completeness and because we're all robust uh, academics here, so we, we understand that. But in practical sense, when we talk about managing uh, problematic levels of primary producers in the coastal zone, really we're mostly talking about uh, these types of groups. We're talking about either macroalgae or microalgae. So things we can see with uh, naked, unaided eye and things that we need a microscope to see, basically. Um, Reds are, are, are red algae. We don't have a huge number of red um, macroscopic algae that are blooms. We have some critters up in Tomales Bay and some things that sometimes are problematic. Don't really also have that many browns that are, uh, that are typically blooming. Um, really, uh, for the macroscopic stuff, it's typically green algae for us and most of our coastal areas that are the ones of concern. The most, co most conspicuous one, the easiest one for you guys to see is if we drive right now down to Magoo or any of our coastal estuaries, you'll see it in the tidal creeks, right? Late summer, early fall is when the, their biomass is the largest. And this is uh, this sea of green that you see when you look out in these tidal creeks. So normally it would be brown, it would be muddy, it'd be sedimenty. Instead, now you're gonna see a lot of, a lot of well, bright green, although some of them are dying back now, so they might look kind of desiccated green, but basically, um, what we used to call Ulva genus and Enteromorpha, another genus. Then it became known as the Ulva Enteromorpha complex. Now they're all lumped into this one genus of Ulva. But basically flat, uh, flat, uh, single cell or just a couple cells thick, a plane of, uh, a pancake of algal tissue, sometimes rolled up in a tube, but basically very, very quick growing, very rapid um, green alga. Um, in various places, but particularly in our coastal estuaries. The other broad category of potentially problematic bloom critters that we're, we might be worried about include things like cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, stuff like that, uh, diatoms, and dinoflagellates. Cyanobacteria are probably pretty obvious to you guys. You guys have encountered those in intro bio. They're basically microbes, bacteria, right? Sort of typical sort of amoeboid shape, kind of you know, amorphous, squishy shape. Um, these are dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are cool. You, you, you have encountered these, but you may, might not have talked about them too much. I'll just touch on them, because these are a key player in um, these issues of so-called red tides or, or algal blooms or what have you. So I put this picture up, the scanning electron microscope picture, because they are really cool. A lot of these crazy cool uh, a phytoplankton and these, these crazy cool mic microbes are really, really cool when you look at them close. Um, uh, as the name implies, dinoflagellates, most of them have a flagellum, right? So they have a whip, a whip, uh, a tail that helps them propel around. Dinoflagellates, uh, not all, but many of them bioluminesce. So their approach to bioluminescing, um, we think, is we're not, don't fully understand it, but it comes with dis oftentimes with disturbance. So the notion is this, I'm a little cell floating out here, boop, 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 I'm doing my thing, boop, 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 and then somebody's gonna come and try to eat me. Ah, oh, that sucks, right? I don't have any teeth, I don't have any, uh, you know, whatever strong defensive mechanism right here, so I'm gonna have to use my biochemistry to defend myself. And one, apparently, one of the somewhat successful evolutionary trends, although this is really an evolutionary arms race, has been for these guys to squirt out a little bioluminescence. And the notion is this. I'm gonna come eat this, this globe right here and chomp, and chomp it down. 
if this, you know, this, this globe's like, damn, I don't want to be eaten. So when I start to get close to this globe, when my, when my pressure wake or whatever comes in and contacts and bumps this, this alga individual, he's like, ha, right? And then he goes, ha, and the guys next to him go, ha, 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 and then all of a sudden, I am lit up. So then me, the predator, has now become lit up. And now my predator might see me. So the notion is, is sort of this alarm theory where um, these guys will light up with the notion of attracting the thing that might control the entity that might eat them. Does that make sense? That's the theory, at least. Now, di dinoflagellates will do this all the time. We get to an algal bloom situation, which is when we have a lot of these guys going on and, and are very abundant. Um, that, l that little light can be crazy. Now, uh, you guys might know of red tides or, or algal bloom situations when we see the water crashing on the, on the beach or the propeller of the boat going through and we see this cool glow, right? If there isn't a strong moon, like, wow, that's really cool. But the bioluminescence, in particular the bioluminescence from dinoflagellates here, this is some of the most amazing things on the, pl these are some of the most amazing things to experience on the planet if you can't, you can't, right? So, you know, birth to my son, yes, married to my wife, yes, all that great stuff, right? <laughs> this stuff doesn't seem real. This stuff seems like a Hollywood movie. And if you've only seen algal blooms or, or red tides at night from the beach or a boat, that's really cool you are missing out. And it is hard to explain how transformative and crazy this is. So I would encourage you guys, if you are scuba divers, to go dive during an algal bloom situation. If you are, if you are a snorkeler, put on a mask. It's really amazing. And when you, when you get into the water, you do not see blue-green fuzz that is what it appears to be from the, from the um, surface. Instead, you see a thousand million little teeny tiny pricks of light in a really big algal bloom situation where we have a high abundance of these critters, you can put your hand out in front of you and swim and circle it around and it's exactly like Mickey Mouse and the Sorcerer's Apprentice. So everywhere I've drawn my hand in the water, those, the, the water has been disturbed, the currents are disturbed, and these, these single-celled critters are flashing, flashing, and it's not, it, it's like a thousand million star light things going off. It is really cool. You put your hand in the water and you can see the entirety of your hand not from moonlight or a dive light or something like that, just because your hand, the, the hairs on your hand, the knuckles, whatever, are bumping into these little cells and they're all flash, 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 flash. So bioluminescence, red tides are really amazing things. If you do ever get the chance to, to put your head, a mask on and put your head in the water during one of these events, they really are crazy cool. Um, so dinoflagellates are a lot of what we, we think about or worry about when we see these algal bloom conditions. But um, other things bloom as well. This, this, these are some examples of diatoms. Diatoms are another one of our uh, members, uh, constituents of our, of our planktonic community, phytoplankton community. These guys are really cool. Their shells are made of glass. Their shells are like a petri dish. Um, so they have one half and one half. We call them a valve, one valve and another valve. They fit together. Crazy cool shapes and, and amazing intricacies and all kinds of cool stuff. So when we get down deep, these, blue, these blooms are really amazing uh, from a natural history perspective, from an ecological perspective, but in the management sense, we're worried about them um, because of some of the consequences. One small example of this, and then we'll get to our lab activity, but one small example of this is on my mind this week because of Hurricane Florence and because of the stuff that's going through North Carolina. So this is a dinoflagellate. This was first isolated from in the uh, 1990s by some professors in North Carolina. This is a dinoflagellate, but it's a freaky dinoflagellate. It can be heterotrophic, so it's not necessarily photosynthetic. So this is freakazoid land. So when we talk about these, these, these algal blooms, we talk about our changing coastal zone. This, is, this sounds like a science fiction story, but this is all real. And as we get more and more perturbed systems, we're unfortunately more likely to get weird stories like this. So here's how the story goes. So this is, this is some of these, these creeks. Again, to reiterate, as you guys are look, reading about on Scoop It and things like that, our, our news stories, uh, we have tons and tons of pig poop flushing into the, the streams and tributaries and waters of 
the Carolinas right now in the wake of this hurricane-induced flooding. Amongst other things, that's flooding the waters with incredibly high levels of nutrients. General rule of thumb is uh, in fresh water, usually one of the most, uh, if we had to pick something that's most problematic nutrient, phosphorus usually the most, the, the phosphorus levels usually tend to drive algal blooms. In nearshore marine salt water, usually it's nitrates or nitrogen. But, but anything can cause any problems. So these guys started noticing um, folks living on some of these rivers downstream of some of these pig farms and these, these large sources of nutrients started reporting Alzheimer's-like diseases. People are walking into somebody else's car, driving around. They're walking, laying down in bed in somebody else's house and the lady's calling like the cops, there's some guy in my bedroom, right? All this weird stuff. So it starts happening, and people are starting to have a lot of memory problems, all this and that. So these researchers started to go, hey, what's going on? I started looking at the, at, at the water, just like you and I would do. Grab one of the bottles from the back of the lab there, go down to the creek, take some water, let's go put it under the microscope, let's start checking out what's going on, right? As we were wont to do, just a little bit of algae from a little bit of a coastal stream. Um, a long story short, these researchers have lost like a year of memory. All of a sudden they don't remember a year. Um, their brains are being affected. We now recognize this thing, Fisteria, so the P is, is silent. Fisteria has to be handled in a class three biohazard uh, uh, area. The only thing that's worse is Ebola and stuff like that. So you cannot st we cannot take this substance, th this, this alga individual, bring it into our lab here and I can't show that to you. That's a massive biohazard. Uh, so our, our changing the coastal environment is leading to changes, and, and these guys bore into fish, these guys kill fish, these guys, the, 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 the uh, species name for this guy is named after the fact that he, they bore in and kill fish. So these guys kill fish, they screw up your memory, it's, it's, it's bizarre. And so, so uh, to be clear, the researchers were exposed because these guys l leach chemicals, and then when we're in the water, we put the jar down on the, on the desk, it's a little bit of a splash of water, and some of those chemicals splash in the air and get you know, aerosolized, and then you're over there and you're looking over the microscope and you're bending it, and you're breathing it in, it's like, what? So this is like kind of crazy military science fiction land, right? So it's not just a problem of a lot of individuals, it's a problem also of some of the substances that these individuals are, are generating. Um, now, when we talk about this changing level of primary producers, there's, we typically, those, that example I gave you, just to be, just by way of, of completion, um, we are talking about, again, different groups of critters, even though we're gonna use the term harmful algal bloom or algal bloom, um, different, different groups of critters, different sizes, although a lot of them are small, but different sizes, and we typically uh, are binning these primary producers by their photosynthetic pigments. That's how we, we oftentimes are doing the, the quick and dirty classification of these guys. Um, the, the variation in algal populations, the boom, bust, et cetera, has always gone on. It's a natural thing. But as with so many things in coastal marine management, the way that we have managed our, our natural world is leading to changes that are inducing all kinds of different um, uh, population dynamics in these, these naturally occurring organisms. Uh, and the other thing to say is, is the influence uh, and the dynamics of these primary producers is beginning to change and we're starting to see larger and larger scale patterns that are, in other words, we used to have a bloom at this one little bay, you know, okay. Now we're starting to see a bloom on the three neighboring bays, et cetera. Um, and then we're always worried about changing the stability of our, of our ecosystem when we start changing these stressors. So when we think about uh, these algal populations, when they're just in the regular low level background, not a problem, right? We don't tend to think about them. From a management perspective, we tend to be worried about them when they bloom or so-called explode in terms of their, their population size. So an algal bloom is any, any you know, rapid growth of a population of algal individuals. Because we're seeing so many downside, potential downsides and, and real downsides to, these al to explosions of these algal populations, in recent years, people have started to use the term harmful algal bloom, or just using the acronym HAB, 
tabs. As these algal populations explode, um, uh, we're worried about things like smothering. So in some cases, if we have these macroscopic uh, critters, like in our estuaries, they can just absolutely smother a critter and, and, and physically you know, not let it do its necessary thing for life or make it hard to move or live or whatever. Um, biomass in the water, photosynthetic biomass. Sunlight's beating down on them, all good, we're pumping out oxygen. At nighttime, we go into the dark phase, at nighttime, those organisms take up oxygen. So if we have a lot of individuals in this confined body of water, let's say, um, they could be robbing the, the body of water of oxygen. So we typically see our lowest dissolved oxygen levels at, at the end of the night, after the whole period of darkness. Once the algal populations get so big, sometimes they start to self-shade and then they run out of nutrients and they eventually start to die back. When they die back, now we have a bunch of biomass of dead or dying individuals that aren't photosynthesizing. And then when they die, the microbial degradation of them is another source of, uh, uh, another demand on the oxygen, so that further suppresses the oxygen level in these restricted water bodies. So we're worried about smothering, worried about low dissolved oxygen, and then um, particularly with things like fisteria and, and other things, um, sometimes these, th the, these organisms, these phytoplankton, can produce toxins. And so they release these toxins, and these toxins themselves are a source of problems. You and I are most familiar with red tides and algal blooms um, in the context of shellfish closures. So the, the, the mussel, we can't eat mussels during certain times of the year or under certain conditions because um, the mussels are fine. The mussels are filter feeders. They're filter feeding these plankton, but um, they're accumulating some of these substances. And typically in that context, we're talking about toxins. So things that would East make coast of Florida, we have some blue-green algal explosions. Or, or so we have a, an algal bloom going off of this side coming out of this waterway from Lake Okeechobee. Uh, short version is, without going into Florida, uh, they completely, we've completely replumbed Florida in terms of how water moves around. And we've replumbed it thanks to the Army Corps of Engineers and, um, and their interest in managing 100% of the water everywhere. And uh, very high numbers of agricultural uh, crops and, and very uh, intensified um, landscapes that need a lot of water and then have a lot of nutrient rich and, and, and pesticides and stuff coming off of that water. So this stuff is flushed out and we, we, we have problems up here. And then we have over here on the west coast a, um, a red tide. So um, all of Florida is having problems right now. And this is, and so we're getting, this has been going on for months. This isn't, didn't show up last week or something. This has been going on for months and months and months. It's now impacting the tourism economy. People are not wanting to go there because there's all these tons of dead fish on the beach, stinking, right, blah, blah, blah. So the stuff on the, on the um, west coast here is primarily toxin driven. So these toxins seem to be the thing that's killing these fish. These fish and, and, and jazz wash up on shore and they cause all these problems, blah, blah, blah. Another, uh, sometimes I stand up here, I talk about fisteria deleting your memory, man. Right, and the world's ending, dude. Dr. Ace is everything's over. It's not true. You guys are over the course of the semester pulling together some some evidence that you think things are going well, things are going bad. What's going poorly? What's 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 doing swimmingly? Right, that kind of stuff. Here's an example of something that's totally kick butt. In recent years, physical oceanographers, people that study how wind and waves and things like that move around. Um, have done some really neat things. So they've formed in different areas of the world so-called ocean observing systems. In uh, our part of the world, we have Senkus and SKUs, Southern California and Central California, ocean observing systems. What is this? This is a stitching together of a bunch of work of various different entities. So people have gotten together, they've agreed what format their data should be in We'll make sure the temperature is in column three and the whatever latitude and longitude is in column one or whatever the case may be. And they've agreed to that data format and now this data is talking to each other and now we can start pulling together from larger and larger regions around. And most of these ocean observing systems have public facing uh, uh, data portals and that's the case here. So I would encourage you after today's lab to go play around 
There's all kinds of crazy cool stuff you guys can look at. V not only is there raw data, there's also viewers. You can look at stuff and explore stuff. We're going to use one of the data products um, that's available to us today in our lab to explore various things. The first thing we're going to explore is algal population, is algal abundance. Now, measuring algal abundance is hard. You and I have to get out. We have to go get that chunk of water with the with the you know with our sampling device bring it back lab pour it in here you and I are going to count all these cells hopefully there's no fristeria hopefully we don't lose our memory but you know that's that's that's, that's, a, that's a very labor intensive pain in the butt thing and we're only going to be able to do it right here at the, our one site the data that we're going to look at today is not that collected data we're using more autonomously collected data so in senku's most of the they do use some data like i just described most of it though is from uh, people putting uh, devices into the water, permanently locating devices in the water, say on a buoy, or in the case of the stuff we're looking at today, using satellite data. So what we're going to look at, at today is uh, algal populations using a proxy for algal populations. Almost, not all, because we know that algal groups are paraphyletic, but almost all of them use chlorophyll A. That's one of the most common photosynthetic pigments. And it turns out, we now know that if we tune our, our, our instruments just you know, the right wavelength, we can actually see the evidence of chlorophyll A being in the, in the ocean. Now, the satellite is not looking deep into the ocean. It's just looking in the very top, top skin of the ocean. But still, for our purposes, that's, that's good. So we're looking at our coast. Okay, This is a color ramp. So the cooler the color, the lower the value of chlorophyll A, and then presumably the less abundant the phytoplankton cells are. Hotter areas in the map are higher concentrations of chlorophyll A and are uh, therefore presumably higher abundances of algal individuals. Cool? So our first step, uh, we're breaking a second, you guys are going to get in, in groups and we're going to go through this. The f and I have some questions on that on the lab handout I sent you. So the first part is just an exploration thing. I want you guys to look and play around with this map. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, etc. And I have a couple questions. Firstly, just uh, where is the highest concentration of algae up and down the California coast? And then secondly, what's the, the overall gross geographic pattern you see to that? Cool? And then we'll get on to the rest of our uh, lab today. Sound good? So I want everybody in teams of two, if we have, if we have an even number, Two, 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 two. We might have one group of three. We have one group of three. The rest of the group is two. So it doesn't matter what group you're in, but just uh, scoot around, say hi to everybody, and, and open up your, your lab manual. And these links are on in the, in the document. You can just click on. And so we'll start with that. Uh, questions so far? Does that make sense? Anybody questions about stuff I just talked about? All right, let's go. Let's start looking at some blooms. 